questions. So I want to thank all of, all of the panelists for their amazing talks and also for their compassionate use of time. Uh, please help me to thank them. We're going to take questions here. We'll give them some applause. We're going to take questions here, but those who need to take a break should take a break because the next session will start at 11 o'clock prompt right here. So um, I'm going to ask the panelists to come up and we'll take questions for those who want to ask them. If I may, I may, I'm going to start off with one difficult question, uh, and then I will cede the floor to others. Uh, it's a question that many people have asked me. Uh, and the question is, why are you using all this fancy brain imaging technology when you could be doing behavior? What does brain imaging tell us, in this case about compassion, that we might not otherwise learn from behavior? Any of you are qualified to answer this? Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll take a quick shot at it. Um, I think that sometimes uh, people are not aware of the uh, motives for their actions. Um, so imagine a pro-social decision uh, that you make. You could make it because you want to get a good reputation, because you want the person to pay you back, because it feels good, because it's your duty to do so, or because of an other-oriented form of compassion. Um, the behavior by itself might not uh, illuminate which of those processes is at work, uh, so imaging is just a converging piece of evidence uh, that allows you to sort of adjudicate between these different possibilities. Yeah, I'd agree, and we can start to look at individual variability so that we can start to tap out what, how these differences are coming out. I think Jamil put it very nicely. Anybody else? Um, imaging is very important, particularly for studying cultural differences, because a lot of the cultural differences that we find tend to not be observable in behavior. So we find this to be a very important and reliable um, way to really observe cultural values and practices and beliefs and how they vary. Wow. Thanks. Um, we have a question over here. I th this was a wonderful session, uh, especially the cultural emphasis. And I was wondering how the members of the panel would feel about the uh, an interpretation of the last uh, e experiment that was described by Bill, where the uh, well, I won't, I won't try to re re describe it, but it seems to me that the it was very, it could be very culturally determined, and that this uh, c conclusion might be totally different in Asia, for example. And I'm wondering if anybody else might have some thought on that. Yeah, I could say a little bit about that. I think that um, you know, if you look at the differences uh, across countries in charitable giving, um, you could attribute that to culture. But when I talk with Europeans for about it, about it, for example, they say, well, I pay 50% of my income in taxes, um, and so it's the government's job to, to use that to improve the welfare of um, low-income people and um, not mine. And now, is that a cultural explanation or an economic one? I'd argue that it's completely consistent with the economic story. But then you might ask, well, how did Europe get to that place and us get to this place? And maybe that ultimately is cultural. Absolutely. I, I think that's a really interesting uh, point of entering into a discussion. But I think that uh, you know, neuroimaging being so um, facile in terms of its interpretation. So there can be many different types of observations, but interpreted in multiple ways. And I think that some of the traction we've made in terms of understanding cultural differences is in really, I'm taking a very strong stand and saying, you know, this region or this area is, uh, you know, is related or associated with this particular type of process. Um, and, you know, of course, the multiple interpretations makes it more interesting for scientists, but also um, uh, more difficult to discern in terms of really finding out how can we achieve compassion? How can we achieve prosociality? Yeah, I'm not sure who is uh, presenting, whether it was Kate or maybe Jen, um, uh, uh, Judson, but uh, there was some comment about like children crying and compassion, or uh, reacting to other uh, children's cries. Yeah. And there's an interesting study out, I think it's somewhere in the 70s, maybe early 80s, um, where they tape recorded children's cries. And if, if an infant heard other children crying, other infants crying, they would respond. But if they heard a tape recording of their own, they would not respond to that in the same way. And, you know, I have a lot of speculation on this myself, being a developmental child psychologist, but I'd be curious, does that mean that there is a self-recognition in some way inherent in that reaction, or is it um, that is a, more of a reaction to the, uh, not about the self, but recognition of others' pain, in a way? 
I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that, I, I was the one who had talked about emotional contagion, but I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say that it would be a recognition of others' pain as much as, it, I mean, it sounds like from those data that there was some sort of uh, efferent copy of, the, uh, of their, one's own voice that then you can use right. to filter out one's own voice, with, which is interesting because then it would account for why when you start crying you don't just, it's not like a positive feedback loop where you just continue sobbing forever. But, uh, <laughs> but this is really interesting. I didn't know about these data. That's, uh, that's really cool. A lot of the data, the developmental data, looking at infants crying is intended, intended to be somewhat transient, uh, situational kinds of influences. And there's a lot of really interesting cultural, uh, cultural psychological behavior work within developmental psychology showing that cultures have different interpretations or way of responding to infant suffering. All right, a follow-up question. Is anybody up here related to an NFL star? <laughs> Do we look like we're related to NFL stars? Check out these gams. Right there. Just two points. First of all, I, I absolutely love this work. Um, I have just a couple of um, concerns about some of the assumptions of economic models. And so I'm wondering two things. One is the interesting um, place that price has in our economy. It makes the assumption that what is purchased is valued by the consumer. And given what we know about hoarding and, um, you know, sort of massive consumption of, of um, very, products that are not valuable, like maybe Walmart could be an example, or um, A, do, um, do economists take into consideration the idea that the consumer is not able to, is, is almost driven by bi biological drives to, to basically grab whatever they see, um, in which case it really, it, 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 it creates an imbalance, I guess, between the consumer and the, and the seller in terms of value and where that gets transferred. And then the other issue is by using neuroimaging to talk about reward centers and to be using a, a broad term like reward, it makes me wonder about uh, behaviors that are involved in investment. And so when we invest in others, when you, we, we not just give to charity and like walk away, but what is it when we're building something. We're building communities or building one another or, or taking families and investing even though we're not getting rewards in return or nothing is coming back to us. And so is there a neuroscience of investment is, my, is one question I have. And the other is are, are economists like even thinking about these, these things that take us outside the limitations, I guess. Yeah, I'd say economists think about that stuff all the time. And, you know, the, the model that I'm giving you is sort of the, the, the old model that is designed to explain very simple kinds of consumption behavior. But the, the points that you raise are, are certainly important and, and not neglected um, in practice by economists. And so one example would be positional goods, where um, you know, there, there's a good that gives you high status, right? And uh, only w one person can have that, that, that good. And the more expensive it is, the more status it gives you, right? So it, one way to think about that is, it, 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 in a sense, you buying that good is creating negative spillovers for the other people who can't have it, right? And economists use that as one justification for a high marginal income tax to discourage exactly that kind of behavior. So, um, and then, then your second point about um, the, um, the positive feelings that people have from, you know, from, in, in, from caring and um, helping other people, um, I, actually, I think that this work is, what, what's so interesting about it is it shows that, that the same neural circuitry is involved in that, and to me, as an economist, um, uh, that is is really good and positive. It means that we can explain it not as an aberration, but as a normal part of uh, human behavior, at least within the economic model. So. But if but if we need to invest, and even when we're not getting the rewards, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Um, there seems to be a a gap. I mean, I guess one of the one of the points here is that even if you're not getting an external reward from, from, from doing something pro-social, you might be receiving an internal reward from doing it. I mean, that said, I think that uh, one of the interesting points that we heard about yesterday was the difference between hedonic and eudaimonic uh, types of action or, 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 or even reward. And I think that so far, uh, neuroscientific models of pro-sociality have really just focused on what we know, which is a system that you would probably interpret as hedonic. Um, I don't think that there is a great neuroscience of eudaimonic uh, 
experience yet, um, but but I, I hope that you know in five or ten years. We, we I might guess have, that's my question. Yeah, yeah. Is there are things going beyond that. So. Phil. A question for Joan, or rather a comment. Uh, I was recently in the Davos Economic Forum and I met a young Korean entrepreneur who consults with Samsung, and he said that a major problem they have is bullying. And he said the whole culture is a bully-based culture, and it's always top-down. Uh, it's not it's not peer-to-peer, -peer, and it's worse between uh, Korean managers and uh, and workers from other countries. And he said, and this is true around the world, and given the power of Samsung, you know, he, he says he, he doesn't know anything being done about it to challenge it. Is that, is that true? I'm trying to reconcile it with your presentation. I think SAMHSA and the Global Mental Health or, uh, Office at NIH are, have a very um, kind of keen insight into this, and t particularly for understanding cultural differences. So, for instance, in organizations where there might be a cultural difference, um, the fact that the preference for a hierarchy doesn't necessarily mean that there's increased bullying. I think that, in fact, theory of mind or having a capacity for understanding rules within an organization as long as everyone agrees with that and is kind of more homogenous in agreement with the theory of mind kind of uh, strategy, you know, then I think that it can actually really re reduce bullying and increase so social harmony, kind of fulfill the, uh, the goals of collectivistic cultures. Um, in a diverse society or a multicultural pluralistic society where you have many different values represented and, uh, mm -hmm. and but embodied within communities, it becomes a much more of a challenge um, to really right. balance that. But I think, again, NIH, SAMHSA absolutely have a clear understanding that, you know, we need to have representation demographics that are really going to be able to provide both cultural information that's valid as well as um, really contribute to our nation's understanding of health and well-being for all people. Right, okay. Um, in your model, there was a really critical point, a, a juncture there where we witness, a person witnesses suffering and then that split between actually going towards compassion or going to um, withdrawal and and it seems like we haven't talked a lot about that juncture and that seems like a really critical place both in the um, teaching of it, the experience of it and in the looking at it and I wonder if you or anybody has more to say about that juncture. Right, absolutely. So in, in the cultural neuroscience um, model where we have uh, looking at ecological pressures is um, influencing cultural and biological processes in the production of sociality. Um, that, you know, there is this diff I think there is this kind of very important, nuanced, um, very subtle distinction between empathy and compassion. Um, compassion is something where, you know, you can at least understand, if not necessarily vicariously experiencing. Empathy, some, I think, though, is also this very valid human emotion where essentially, in cases where there, there tends to be both, you know, it, kind of this acute and also kind of sustained prosociality, that, that, that vicarious feeling can be absolutely very beneficial of evolutionarily and uh, um, meaningful. So um, absolutely think that there's an understanding of compassion that's kind of a universal and then also um, an importance for understanding the cultural neuroscience of, of both compassion and empathy. Yeah. And I'll just quickly add, because it looks like we're about to finish, it's, it was interesting seeing uh, Brian's data and our data and it might suggest that there's this continuum where we start somewhere um, you know, there's this saying from, I think, Jack Engler says, you need a self to transcend self. So we start where we, where we know, and we start with these self-referential, you know, empathetic processes, and we start to learn, you know, what's this feel like? Uh, and then are there, are there greater pleasures that lead to selfless giving? And we, we might be able to start to tease out a continuum from the beginner to the experienced meditator, just as an example. Just to add to that, you know, there's this idea in the Buddhist compassion meditation practice that you start with your, your mother, basically, and you extend out. And then one can imagine getting much more abstract, right? All sentient beings. And so there might be an interesting parallel there as well. Uh, thank you for that fascinating session. And obviously, it stimulated a lot of questions. But unfortunately, I think for the sake of time, we're going to have to conclude. So I'm sorry. Thank you.